Hi guys, it's Sophie. So today I'm going to be making a video about Jose Saramago. I spoke about him briefly in my March wrap up and this is going to be a video speaking about him in a more sort of focused way. So first off, who is this guy and why should we care? So Saramago um, was a Portuguese author. Um, he was born in 1922 and died in 2010. He wrote a number of novels that sort of gained literary acclaim um, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1998. So it's not just me, he thinks he's good. Um, lots of other people do too. There are a couple of facts about his life that I need to mention before we go into the books themselves because I think they are an integral part of his writing. So first off, he was an anarchist communist. Um, so he believed in the abolition of the state and thought that individuals should make their own sort of smaller collectives um, or, or work on an individual basis. He was also a supporter of direct or pure democracy in which people don't vote for a candidate who has a number of policies but vote directly on policies themselves. Um, so really having a lot more control to the individual. And the next thing I think is important is that he was an atheist um, and he was relatively outspoken about his atheism. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gospel According to Jesus Christ which was banned by the Prime Minister of Portugal um, and it, it was on a literary prize list and it got removed um, because they thought it was too sort of anti-religion to be allowed on there. So Saramago was obviously cross that his book had been removed um, and sort of put himself in a position where he didn't really feel comfortable in Portugal anymore. So he lived for the remainder of his life from 1992 to 2010 in Spain where he felt that he could write more freely. So the two books I'm going to be talking to you about are Blindness, um, which is the first one in a two part and the second one is the second book in the two part and that one is Seeing. So I wouldn't say that these books are for the faint of heart um, but don't let that put you off. When you first read them it is an unusual style and if you're not used to reading in slightly different forms it may pull you out of the story a little bit to begin with but it's a bit like a clockwork orange in that when you get in you sort of don't really see it anymore. So Saramago writes with run-on sentences, um, his dialogue doesn't have any quotations or paragraph breaks, everything is embedded in the text. So really when you're reading this you have to immerse yourself in the text um, and there's no sort of way out of it. So in Blindness, the first of the two books that I wanted to talk about, um, we follow a society in which, for seemingly no apparent reason, people start going blind. So it begins with just one man who's driving his car and around him at this traffic lights, there are lots of other people sort of beeping and getting very annoyed and he almost stumbles out of his car and he's gone blind, he's completely blind and slowly but surely when he interacts with people the blindness starts to spread and faced with this epidemic of blindness as it becomes as the story progresses the government and, and the sort of army really don't know what to do with all of these people. That they're, they're definitely seems dangerous because there is a contagious element to this, this epidemic. And they start out with relatively good intentions. They start sort of picking people up with the idea that they're going to be treating them. And it becomes apparent that they aren't going to be able to make anything better. So all they'll do is they'll just quarantine them. And they're trying to think of places where could we quarantine these people. And they realise that they can do it in old abandoned buildings. So what you end up with is a situation in which you have hundreds of blind people trapped in an abandoned mental hospital who can't see or look after or care for themselves but because it's contagious no one can go in and help them. Now in all of this um, you'd think it'd be very very chaotic. I mean think day of the Triffids, right? However one of the main characters, a woman who was married to an ophthalmologist who was one of the first affected, doesn't lose her sight when everyone else around her does and we follow her story quite closely. She's, she's the way we're seeing the society really and around her is just chaos, uh, but no one can see what's happening, no one can see what's going on, and the government don't have any kind of a handle on it. I don't want to go too much further into the story because then it becomes sort of spoiler territory. What I've told you so far I think is necessary to understand the background to this book, uh, but I don't think that you need to know all of it for me to explain it to you. So as a summary, this book is about the collapsing of a society and about how the government and all of the sort of forces that people put their money in and put their faith in uh, really can just fall down and fall completely flat when they face a situation that they've never seen before. Um, it's also aided by the fact that we have this one person who is able to see, who is acting as the sort of guiding light for us through the story. It's dark, it's difficult to read, and it's absolutely brilliant. And then Seeing, so this is the second book in the series. This one I don't think gives spoilers for the first book in the series, but be warned if you are very interested in that one and you don't want to know anything else, maybe don't listen to the rest of this video. So at the very beginning of Seeing, we have a political vote. Uh, it's a rather rainy morning and you have all of these officials standing around in the polling booth looking out at the weather and 
They're a little bit worried about the fact it's raining so hard and worrying about the turnout. And as the day goes on, their fears are sort of confirmed. No one's turning up, and they really only have a handful of people who've bothered to come out and vote. Um, and they're getting more and more concerned. They're getting to the point where they're calling their family members. And then at 4 p.m., for no apparent reason, near everyone leaves the house in one go and comes and votes. So they're they're sort of you know quite excited about this. They think everyone's come through. They've they've shown their patriotism. They've come and done what they needed to do. However, when they count the votes, they find that an alarming percentage of them are blank. So they go back to the sort of political leaders and they say, look, we don't think that this is really right. Maybe something's messed up. We can't have all this many blank votes. So they run the vote again. Um, but when they count the votes from the capital, 80% of them are blank this time. It's only getting worse. So the government do what any responsible government would do. And they don't treat this as a choice that these individuals have made. It's a punishable offence. So in this novel, we are definitely seeing it from the government's point of view. Whereas in blindness, we definitely saw it from the individual's point of view. Uh, we follow sort of something they call the Minister of the Interior, um, sort of different state officials, the police force, as they're combating what they're seeing as this blind, blank vote situation. So this is a situation in which the democracy that's been built up has been rendered entirely useless by the people who are supposed to be sort of pushing it forward and, and obeying to a point, and the government is losing its power. So this book sort of focuses on what happens when a government is reduced in its importance and the things that people will do if you take their power away. Now I have a quote to read to you from this book um, to give you an idea of his writing and to give you an idea of the power of his writing. Uh, I think it's a little bit long but please hang on with me, it's worth it. So the quote I'm about to read you just in the context, the blank votes have been cast, the government are very worried and they're turning to odd measures to try and find out who has voted um, and who has cast a blank vote. His plan, as you'll have no doubt guessed, was to bring back into the fray the famous polygraph, also known as the lie detector, or, in more scientific terms, a machine that's used to record, simultaneously, various psychological and physiological functions, or, in more descriptive detail, an instrument for registering physiological phenomena of which an electrical recording is made on a damp sheet of paper impregnated with potassium iodide and starch. Connected to the machine by a tangle of wires, armbands and suction pads, the patient does not suffer. He simply has to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to cease to believe in the universal assertion, the old, old story which, since the beginning of time, has been drummed into us, that the will can do anything. For you need look no further than the following example which denies it outright, because that wonderful will of yours, however much you may trust it, however tenacious it must have been up until now, it cannot control twitching muscles. It cannot staunch unwanted sweat or stop eyelids blinking or regulate breathing. In the end, they'll say you lied. And you'll deny it. You'll swear you told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that might be true. You didn't lie. You just happened to be a very nervous person with a strong will. It's true. But you are nevertheless a tumultuous reed that shivers in the slightest breeze. So they'll connect you up to the machine again, and it will be even worse. They'll ask if you're alive and you'll say, of course I am, but your body will protest, will contradict you. The tremor in your chin will say, no, you're dead. And it might be right, perhaps your body knows before you do that they're going to kill you. It will be unlikely that this could happen in the cellars of the Ministry of the Interior. The only crime these people have committed is to cast a blank vote. And that would have been of no importance if they had merely been the usual suspects. But there are a lot of them, too many, almost everyone. And who cares if it's your inalienable right when they tell you it can only be used in homeopathic doses, drop by drop? You can't come here with a pitcher filled full to overflowing with blank votes. That's why the handle dropped off. We always thought there was something suspicious about that handle if something that could carry a lot was satisfied with carrying little. That shows an almost praiseworthy modesty. What got you into trouble was ambition. You thought you could fly up to the sun and instead you fell headfirst into the Dardanelles. And you'll recall that we said the same about the interior minister. But he belongs to a different race of men. The macho, the virile, the bristly chinned, those who will not bow their head. Let's see now how you escape the hunter of lies. Let's see what revealing lines your large and small transgressions will leave on that strip of paper impregnated with potassium iodide and starch. And you thought you were something special. But this is what the most vaunted supreme dignity of the human being is reduced to. 
a damp piece of paper. So I hope you can see what I mean about the writing, about the power of his writing. Uh, when I read that section I underlined the entire lot and then had to go and read it to my brother and read it to myself again. It's full of things like that, that isn't the only one, uh, but that was one of my favourites. So in short, I think that Jose Saramago is an incredible writer. His writing is also satirical, although you didn't really see much of it in the excerpt I read to you. Pieces of it are very funny, very darkly funny. Um, he's incredibly intelligent and has an almost unnatural gift to sort of shed light on a society in the places where maybe we don't want to see what's behind the shadows. If you are interested in this book or in blindness, either one that I've mentioned, do let me know down below. Um, I'd love for more people to be getting into reading his work uh, on Booktube. I've not seen anyone else talking about him at all and I think he deserves a lot more praise here than he's getting at the moment. I hope that you've enjoyed this video, you're having a lovely day and that your government is working for you and not against you. Right, goodbye.